Infrastructure as code keeps popping up over and over again as one of the most requested skills in DevOps jobs. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through what infrastructure as code actually means, what employers are looking for, how I interview for it, and some tips to level up your skills if you need to brush up in that area. Hey, what's going on? I'm Will Button from DevOps for Developers, and I actually love talking about infrastructure as code because infrastructure can actually mean like buildings or roads, railroad lines, plumbing systems, electrical grids, or in our case, software. I feel like I need a hard hat and one of those orange vests. That'd be pretty badass. Most of our infrastructure these days is actually virtualized, so it's pretty uncommon to actually go into a data center with a bunch of boxes and start racking servers and running network cables. Most of us operate using cloud providers like AWS or Azure or GCP. And so everything is just software running on top of software. And even if you do have your own physical data center, you typically run something virtualized on top of that and you don't operate in a like a one server per one application type environment. So the reason the infrastructure as code skills are so important to employers is because it really gives you the ability to do two things. One is document the state and status of your infrastructure, and the other is it allows you to scale up and scale down efficiently. Documenting your infrastructure as code gives you a couple of benefits. It allows you to track changes for logging and auditing purposes. It provides you a current state of your infrastructure for disaster recovery, and it can help with security audits if you're in a compliant type industry that's subject to PCI, HIPAA, or one of those type um, auditing requirements. The other benefit I mentioned is it allows you to more easily scale up and down. This allows you to provision more capacity whenever there's an increase in utilization of your service and then scale those resources back down whenever that increased demand goes away. So you're able to tie your operating costs more closely to the actual utilization of your service so that you're not paying money for resources that you don't need. There's a lot of different tools that you can use to document your infrastructure as code. And I'm gonna talk about three of the most common ones in this video, those being Ansible, Terraform, and CloudFormation. Each of those has a different specific purpose and there's also some overlap in the things that they do, which is why I'm bringing those three out in this video. Let's start with Ansible. And Ansible is primarily used as a configuration management tool. So what that means is that for every server that you have in your infrastructure, it's got a specific job to do, right? It might be an application server or a memcache or Redis server or a database server. For it to fulfill that role, it needs to have the appropriate software installed. It has to be configured. You've got to have some like user password management stuff on there so that anyone accessing it has the right credentials and you can ver verify those credentials, right? And when you look at a server on the whole, there's like some common tasks that have to happen across all of your servers, such as configuring IP tables for firewall access, provisioning user accounts so you can determine who's able to log into this server. You might need to set up logging, some type of log shipping solution so that the logs from that server are shipped off to a centralized logging service, whether that's Splunk or the Elk stack or something along those lines. And now the benefit of using Ansible is it works with every operating system that's out there. So you can use Ansible, write your code once, and then deploy it across any different operating system. And Ansible figures out the different things that it needs to change or manipulate in order to put what you've defined in code into operation on that server. So Ansible's for configuration management and Terraform is more for provisioning. So think of things like building out a VPC in AWS to operate an application, whether that's a dev environment, staging environment, or production. And even you could have different production environments within different VPCs, depending on how your application's built out. You can also use Terraform to provision multiple servers together. So if you need multiple application servers that work with a single database application, you can, you can define that entire stack and then just let Terraform manage and deploy that for you. Terraform works with all the major cloud providers and it can also work with on-premises equipment 
if you have your own physical data center. And that's one of the strong points for using Terraform is it can work with any provider, whereas something like CloudFormation is AWS specific. So if you need to use Terraform for your on-premises data center, your physical data center, and because you have stuff in AWS, I think it's a great fit for it. Where I see some people kind of get steered off track though, is they'll provision stuff for AWS and a backup provider like Azure or GCP. And their reasoning behind that is, well, what if AWS goes down? So let's talk about that for just a minute. Within AWS or Azure or GCP, doesn't matter, you can deploy your service across multiple regions. I'm gonna use AWS as an example here. You can deploy to US East, and then if you use different availability zones in US East, you've got disaster protection in different physical data centers within AWS to keep your application resilient and up and running in the face of disaster. Now, in the scenario that the entire US East grid goes away in AWS, that's gonna be a problem for your app. But knowing how AWS is architected in that scenario, I'm gonna be honest, my big scenario, my big priority at that moment is not gonna be getting our, our application back up and running, but it's gonna be grabbing some weapons in our bug out bag and heading to the mountains somewhere because if US East one is gone, it means there's a significant chunk of the United States gone as well. I'm not too concerned about our app at that point. All right, the third one I wanna talk about here is CloudFormation. And CloudFormation is for provisioning, but it's specific to AWS. Now, one of the reasons you might wanna use CloudFormation is because you are operating just in AWS and you may not have a lot of other uses for a tool like Terraform or Ansible. For example, if you're using all RDS for your databases and your application is using something like Fargate or serverless Lambda functions, and you just simply don't have any other infrastructure that would necessitate the need for Terraform or Ansible, CloudFormation is a great choice because it natively knows how to speak to all those AWS services. And one of the things I like about it is you can take your CloudFormation templates and store those within the application repo itself. So if I've got an API application that I'm deploying, I can put the CloudFormation template for that in the same code that the developers use to write that application itself. And then whenever we pump that through CI CD, it can run CloudFormation and make sure that the application environment is in the state that it's supposed to be in as part of our normal deploy process. So one of the important things to know though, is that these tools are not siloed, right? With Ansible, you can do the same provisioning that you can do with Terraform. And with Terraform, you can do the same configuration management that you can do with Ansible. And with Ansible, you can do the same stack deployment of CloudFormation templates that you could do with CloudFormation. And so there's tons of overlap here. So don't think that you have to like sandbox all of these. You kind of want to pick and choose what's right for the application that you're supporting. You know, a lot of that just comes from getting experience with, this, with these tools to understand what their capabilities are and where they work best at. One of the scenarios that you might see pretty frequently is using Terraform to provision your infrastructure and then use Ansible to configure it. And what I mean by that is you'll have Terraform provision out your EC2 instances and your database servers, and then Terraform will actually call Ansible. Ansible will be the one that logs into the servers, provisions the user's account, installs the packages, such as Nginx or Apache or whatever is needed on that. And so those two work in concert together to create your entire application environment. When I'm interviewing candidates for DevOps roles and we get to this part of the conversation, there are certain things that I'm looking for and we're kind of at this point in the conversation, we're out of the technical, how do I do X, you type this command thing. Here we're starting to get into some more conceptual type stuff. And it's because there's a million different ways that you can pull this off. And of those million, like, I don't know, 900,000 of them are valid ways to do it. So there's getting to the area where there's fewer right or wrong type questions. And so the conversation becomes more theoretical at this point. Some of the things that I'm looking for is to talk with you about 
how you store your infrastructure as code. You know, you put it in a Git repo, does it follow a workflow similar to any other type of application where you'll create a feature branch and do your work in that feature branch and then open up a pull request and have someone review that pull request before merging it into master? And how do you manage that across multiple environments? Do you use the same repo with different flags to deploy to dev or staging or production and that type of stuff. Another thing we're gonna talk about is how you manage secrets because a big part of these tools is getting application and environment specific secrets into a server. And so I wanna know how you manage that. Um, I wanna specifically know that you're not storing those secrets unencrypted in the code repo and then just talk about different strategies from there of how to do it, whether that's using uh, some type of vault service, whether that's HashiCorp vault or AWS secrets manager or something along those lines. And this really leads into a lot of scenarios with why questions. And so here's one thing to know, um, like if you're interviewing for me, I might say something like, tell me how you would deploy um, three servers geographically distributed that talk to a centralized database. And you might say something like, well, I might use Ansible and build out, you know, whatever your answer is. And I'm gonna say, oh, Ansible, you're gonna use Ansible for that, huh? And so it's really important and helpful for you to know that I'm not calling bullshit at that point. The only thing I'm doing is just giving you some feedback to get you to elaborate into more about what your decision was because I really don't care what the decision was. I just wanna know your thought process behind it. Like why did you pick Ansible? What was your thought process? Did you consider other alternatives? How are you thinking about using Ansible in this environment? And again, it's not looking for a right or wrong answer, it's looking for what your thought process is. Because if we work together, we're gonna to encounter hundreds of thousands of different scenarios that can be solved hundreds of thousands of different ways, which leads to infinite possibilities. And the only thing I need to know is that you're thinking through the different things that you know about to make good decisions. And it doesn't mean that it's gonna go right every time. I mean, stuff's gonna blow up, and when it does, we'll just deal with it. If you don't have strong skills in this area, there's a couple of different things you can do to level up those skills. First of all, you've got your own workstation that you use, right? You can actually use Ansible to manage your own workstation. Think about it, you've got different things that you have to have on your workstation. No matter what workstation you're using, you've got your code editor that you use, you've got your browser, whether that's Chrome or Brave or Firefox or whatever, that's gotta be installed. You've got SSH keys that you use to access different servers that you log into. And odds are you've got Docker installed so that you can run Docker containers locally. So all of those have to be installed and configured no matter which laptop or workstation you're using. And so you can create your own Ansible script that does all of those steps for your workstation. You can also use something like VirtualBox or Hypervisor to install and run a Linux server on your workstation and then use Ansible to configure that to be a database server or a web application server or anything else. And it gives you a chance to experiment with writing Ansible code and that'll give you the opportunity to work with Ansible and write some Ansible specific code, test it out on a remote machine, remote in this case being a virtualized server on your workstation, but it's the same principle and then turn that into an Ansible playbook and then destroy the entire environment, bring it up from scratch again and see what you overlooked or missed or fails this time and keep refining those skills as you go. You can do the same thing if you're using or have access to a cloud provider such as AWS. Um, again, if you're gonna use AWS for something like this, make sure that you understand where you're incurring costs at. Whenever you launch an EC2 instance, that's gonna be costing you money outside of the free tier there's gonna be file storage from your disk space that's used by your EC2 instance. Even when you terminate that EC2 instance, those volumes may be left behind that you have to go delete manually to ensure that you aren't getting charged once you think you're done with that. You can also use a tool like Ansible or Terraform locally 
to deploy Docker containers to your local Docker installation. And that's another great way to spin up application environments and build these skills. And that's one of the things that I look for whenever I'm talking to people about this is how do you do that integrated environment? So let's say you either either using Docker or just virtualized Linux instances, you launch a web application server and a database server, and the web application server has to talk to the database server. So how do you manage that? The web application server has to know the name of the database server so or the IP address so that it can talk to it. And then it's also going to need credentials um, in the form of a username and password to access that. So how do you integrate all of those together into a package so that it works as a complete system that's all documented via the code that you wrote? One last thing I'm going to point out here just because it's one of my favorite tools and that's the Bodo3 library for AWS. Bodo3 is a library provided by AWS that allows you to access pretty much everything in AWS. Understanding Bodo3 gives you a deep level of understanding of how things operate in the underlying layers of AWS whenever it comes to launching and managing resources. And so spending some time to not only study that, understand what's available there, but also integrate it into your code to perform certain actions in AWS will give you a broad knowledge of not only infrastructure as code, but also AWS as well, and some insight and some skills that apply to different cloud providers as well. So any time that you spend working with the Bodo3 library is gonna be time that's well spent, and it's just gonna serve you continuously throughout the years of your career. All right, if I miss anything, drop me a note in the comments down below. And if you try some of these things out, drop a comment as well. Let me, let me know how it's going for you. And then uh, I'll see y'all in the next video.